I will be starting in-person classes here in Asheville, North Carolina soon. If you would like to join and attend an in-person class here in Asheville, North Carolina, please click on the Silicon Dojo meetup link down below. Welcome back. As you know, I am Eli the Computer Guy, and in today's class, we're going to be answering the question of what is Ethernet? So, uh, so this is like the third or fourth uh, class in this whole networking series, and one of the things I really want you folks to understand is that a whole bunch of different components and different technologies come together to give us the internet or the networking access that we have today. One of the big problems for new people that get into the computer field is that frankly they try to oversimplify in their minds what's going on and then they get confused because they're just skipping over you know massive numbers of topics right they want they want everything to be less complicated than it is because it's easier to pass tests if things are less complicated but that's not how the technology world works right uh, so when we talk about networking there are so many different subjects to talk about about. There's servers, there's client computers, uh, there, there's internet service providers, there's what is the cloud, there, there's routing protocols, there's networking protocols, there's storage protocols, there's, there's all kinds of different things. And if you can't visualize in your mind all of these different concepts, it's going to be much harder for you uh, to be able to build out infrastructure or to be able to maintain infrastructure. Because as I talked about before, when I did the class on the OSI model, so much of being a real real technology professional is understanding what it is that you're looking at and then being able to focus on what the actual problem is, right? If you understand that, your life is gonna be a lot easier as a technology professional. If you don't understand that, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> It sounds bad to say, but maybe you really should go off and be a florist. So anyways, today we're going to be talking about the Ethernet technology. This is the technology that most of us use to connect to networks and to connect to the internet today. Now it is important to understand when we talk about the Ethernet technology that we're not talking about protocols, right? So protocols, uh, normally we talk about this as networking protocols, and so that would be something like TCP IP4 or TCP IP6 possibly IPX, SPX, we still got that around somewhere. The protocol is the language that is used by computers or devices to be able to communicate over the networking technology. Ethernet is the networking technology. To be clear, the protocol is not part of it. The language is not part of that. So you can have many different types of protocols running over the Ethernet technology, um, but they are a separate thing. So when we talk about the Ethernet technology, what we're talking about here is the type of media we are going to use in order to connect all of our devices, right? As I talked about before, when we talk about media and networking, you can use coax cable, you can use fiber optic cable, uh, you can use wireless, connections. You can use all kinds of, of different cables. And so one of the things that we need is we're going to connect all these computers. We have to standardize quite literally on what cable we're going to use to be able to, to, uh, to communicate. Uh, and so with networking nowadays, we use something CAT6, uh, something called CAT6 or possibly CAT5E, hopefully not CAT5 anymore. <laughs> You definitely want to make sure you're not using CAT3. But anyways, these are these are networking cable standards uh, that are standards for the Ethernet technology. How all of the devices connect together. We talked about topologies before, about rings and buses and star topologies. And so when you're using Ethernet technology, you're using a star typology, their topology. So basically when we're talking about Ethernet today, we're talking about all these very basic low level requirements uh, to be able to actually uh, connect and, and have all these devices be able to, to communicate with each other. Now one of the big things that you're going to see when I talk about other te net technology, if you don't know not a lot about networking beforehand, is you're going to see a lot of frustrating kind of absurdities uh, when you when you start talking about Ethernet. Like when you start talking about Ethernet and we start talking about collision avoidance and collision detection and a whole bunch of different things, one of the things that's going to go through your mind is, really? <laughs> Seems like there's got to be a better way of dealing with networking at this point in time. One of the things that you do have to grasp when we talk about Ethernet or we talk about TCP IP4, many of the protocols, many of the standards that we use for networking today is that a lot of these standards and a lot of these technologies are actually 
incredibly old, right? When we talk about the basic Ethernet standard, one of the reasons it's going to seem ridiculous to you is that the, the, the basic concept of this was literally created before I was born. Not before I was in college, not before I was in high school, not before I was in elementary school, before I was born. The, the basics of Ethernet were created in 1973 uh, by Xerox Corporation, right? And so one of the issues that we have in modern networking is we're using a lot of really old concepts that really, if we lived in a sane world, should have been scrapped a long time ago. But, well, welcome to the world of technology. It's kind of funny, like with noobs in the technology world and people that aren't in the technology world, you know, what they say is, oh my golly, technology moves so fast. Technology moves so fast, you can't possibly keep up with it. And I don't know, for some of us old timers, we're like, I, I only wish. I only wish, I only wish we used networking uh, technology that was up to 2022 standards and weren't using crap from 1973. I wish we were using uh, networking protocols that again, weren't from decades ago. What you find in the infrastructure world and in the world that actually makes most of this technology function is that a lot of it is horribly old. It's horribly old. It was literally designed for hardware. <laughs> That's 50 years old. And so when you when you have concepts and you have topology, you have all this kind of stuff that's built for a world of 50 years ago, and essentially you, you force it into this warp speed, this uber world that we have today, you just run into a tremendous number of problems. So when we talk about things like reliability, when we talk about things like security, one of the big things, just as a little side tangent, it's one of the things I find hilarious when people talk about security in the modern internet today, uh, security and anonymity. One of the reasons I find this concept absolutely hilarious is that's not what TCP IP4 was built for. <laughs> If you go back to the 1980s and you look at how all the communication networks were, were originally created, uh, they were known trusted uh, networks and known trusted devices, so they weren't so worried about security. And initially, uh, the, the internet, ARPANET essentially, uh, turned into the internet and all this kind of stuff. Initially, this was a project by the U.S. government that then went out to universities, and so they literally did not want anonymity. They wanted to know who the hell was communicating with everybody else. And so it's kind of funny in a world, in a zero trust world where people are trying to remain anonymous, where are you still using TCP IP for? Which it's just a sad joke. It's just a sad joke. Anyways, the final thing that I'll say today before I really get into this class is you will notice that I say the word Ethernet. Oh, I'm sure a lot of noobs right now are losing their minds. Eli, the computer guy, don't you know it's Ethernet? Ethernet was based off the concept of ether, and so you say it as Ethernet. Um, this is kind of an interesting thing, because because sadly, sadly, I create content that goes on the internet. So unfortunately, I am confronted with questions that you would just never deal with in the normal world. But, right, you have a lot of noobs out there and they're trying to they're trying to stump the jump. They're trying to be like, hey, maybe Eli doesn't actually know as much as he thinks he does. One of the things I'll say is do remember, I have been doing technology since 1996. I started in the US Army doing technology and then got into the IT world with Windows NT 4.0. And one of the curious things is that a lot of pronunciation uh, has changed over the years. And a lot of times that the pronunciation that you use when you're talking about different technologies is based off of how you were taught it. Um, I think about this with MySQL uh, or SQL, right? A lot of, a lot of youngins out there try to gig me because I say SQL. Apparently, the right way to do it is say SQL. Um, I don't know. I was taught SQL. Everybody I knew said SQL when I <laughs> walked into the shop. It was SQL. And so, I don't know, maybe it's, maybe it's a holdover from, from 20 years ago, but I don't say SQL. That just seems slow and just, just hard on the ears. What kind of noob would say SQL? You say SQL. But it's just one of those things, it's pronunciation. As far as Ethernet goes, instead of Ethernet, 
actually did do some research on this to find out what was going on, and apparently 15 to 20 percent of the geeks out there say Ethernet, and 80 to 85 percent of the geeks out there say Ethernet. And so I'm, shockingly, it's gonna be shocking to say this, I'm in the minority that does something a little bit different than what the majority does. And you know what? I don't care if you don't want to keep if you don't want to keep watching this class because I say Ethernet instead of Ethernet, that's your business. But I think those are some of the basically the, the ground things to be thinking about before we start talking about the, the Ethernet technology. Basically, just simply do realize when we talk about Ethernet, this is this is all the connect the, the basic connectivity, the, the the types of equipment that we're going to use to connect networks, the type of wiring we're going to use to connect networks, um, some of the basic uh, communicate the very basic communication protocols in order to connect networks. And again, when you start looking at this and you're like, golly. This just seems janky as hell. It's because it is. <laughs> because it is. It's from 1973. <laughs> we should have stopped using most of this crap a long time ago. But, of course, that's its own rant. Okay, so let's start diving into some of the stupidity of the Ethernet technology standard. Uh, so again, one of the things to be thinking about is the topology, essentially how you physically lay out your network with any of these different types of technology. And with Ethernet, we use the star topology. So what this means is essentially you're kind of a switch or theoretically a hub, theoretically a hub, We'll get into that stuff a little bit later. But basically, you have one, essentially a splitter, and off of that splitter, you have all of your computers, your devices, your servers, uh, your voice over IP phones, your surveillance cameras, and everything else. So think about the splitter, the, very, the, the initial concept of the splitter. Think of it basically as a cable splitter. So anybody out there still have cable TV? If you don't, remember 10 years ago when people had cable TV. Uh, and essentially, if you wanted the, the cable connection to go to multiple rooms in your house or go to multiple TVs, uh, you would essentially just have a splitter, and that would just essentially split the wire, split the signal to, to however many different um, televisions you wanted that signal to go to. Uh, essentially, when you think about the Ethernet standard and how this was initially designed, uh, think about that only with two-way communication. So not only can a, t a signal, TV signal or whatever uh, go to the device, but that the device can actually send communication back down the line uh, to be able to communicate with some other device or some other server or something else on the network, right? So this is basically how uh, an Ethernet uh, network is laid out. But again, one of the important things to understand whenever we're dealing with technology is that it's not it's not magic. It's not magic, right? There, there actually has to be a system for how all of this works. And so when you have um, basically the splitter here and you have your multiple devices essentially connected to the splitter what happens is that these uh, all of these devices the servers devices whatever else they use something called carrier sense multiple access collision avoidance and carrier sense multiple access collision detection Right? So what happens here is you have these devices, and let's say uh, computer one here wants to co uh, communicate with computer two uh, up on the other side of the network. The first thing computer one is going to do is it's going to listen. It's going to listen to see if any other computer on the network is talking. So let's uh, let's imagine computer three over here was con uh, communicating with uh, computer four, and so there basically computer three was communicating. So when com computer one goes to talk, basically goes to try to communicate with uh, computer two, it's listening, it hears that there's that communication on the network, and so it just keeps its mouth shut. Right, so that's pretty simple, right? So if somebody, if another computer is talking, you're not going to talk. It then waits until that communication is over. When it is, it keeps listening, and then it goes and it tries to communicate with uh, computer number uh, number two uh, and send whatever information. Now, one of the issues you have with a system like this, especially as it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger again, remember, scale is everything. What works beautifully with two computers is a brick with 2,000. Uh, again, one of the issues we have with, with, uh, with Ethernet standard. But it basically, 
one of the questions that has it has to be asked is what happens if computer number one wants to communicate with number two uh, let's say computer number eight wants to communicate with uh, computer number nine and so they're both waiting right so computer three is communicating with computer four so nobody talks everybody keeps their mouth shut and then that communication is over so both computer one and computer eight here there's nothing on the line and so they at the exact same time try to communicate right so uh basically with them they try to communicate and you have what is called a collision so those the, the packets the frames however you want to call it uh basically go onto the network at the exact same time eight is trying to talk to nine one is trying to talk to two the packets go onto this shared network they hit each other and that is what we call a collision. And so part of the whole communication process with Ethernet is to listen for those collisions to know essentially that the, uh, the information did not get sent to, to the recipient computer because the information that was being sent, there was a collision on that. And so what happens then is the computers that we're trying to communicate, so in this uh, computer one and computer eight, what happens then is they will wait a random amount of time. So they randomize it. They will wait a random amount of time. Again, listen to see if there's any communication on the network. If there's not any communication on the network, they then send to the computer uh, that they're trying to send to, and hopefully everything works out fine, right? So that's, uh, that's a, a collision avoidance and collision detection. So here's, here's a question, here's a question. Again, so we've got four computers here, but what happens when you have five computers and six computers and 50 computers and 100 computers and 1,000 computers all essentially using a splitter? So originally when all this stuff was connected together, we had something called hubs. Hubs quite literally are basically just splitters, just splitters. So what happens when you have 50 or 100 computers all trying to communicate using collision avoidance, collision detection? Uh, when there's a collision, they all wait a random amount of time uh, and before they try to communicate again. Again, this works with four, five, ten computers. When you start having 50 or 100 computers, you start having lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of collisions on the network because essentially every time anybody tries to communicate with anybody else about everything, right? There's a collision on the network. Everybody waits a random amount of time before they try to communicate again, but you have so many computers on the network that basically means you're still going to have multiple computers still trying to communicate at the same time. And that's where we get something called a broadcast storm. Uh, so this used to be prominent back in the 90s, again, with something, something called hubs before we got to switches or even bridges. Essentially, you'd have all these, these computers that they were trying to communicate they were they were, they were wait, randomly waiting amounts of time. They were then trying to communicate again, which then had another collision, which had computers waiting more time. We then have another collision, another collision, another collision, and that's where we get something called broadcast storms that will essentially bring your entire network uh, to its knees. And again, when, when I talk about this, it's important to understand this isn't a TCP/IP thing. This isn't about IP addresses or anything like that. Uh, that this is basically just built into the Ethernet standards. So one of the things to be thinking about uh, with Ethernet is when you're building uh, networks, just from the, this, this Ethernet uh, concept, is that you have something called collision domains, right? So essentially, if you have so many computers oh, connected uh, to this hub and you get to a certain number, 10, 20, 30, uh, whatever it is, uh, basically that number would essentially bring that network to its knees. One of the things you can say is like, okay, I know 10 computers can be connected to this hub and they will be able to communicate uh, properly. They'll be able to communicate well. That is then considered a collision domain. So all the computers that are connected to that particular hub, essentially that particular uh, uh, splitter, they are within their own collision domain. So one of the things that you can do to have more computers be able to communicate is you could then have computers essentially connected uh, to another hub, to another splitter, and they create their own collision domain over here. So let's say you have 10 computers here within their collision domain, and then you have 10 computers here within their collision domain, and they have another 10 up here, they're up under their collision domain, so on and so forth. And so this is where we begin to have the concepts 
of separate networks. And then what we're going to do is then we're going to try to connect these separate networks together so that essentially the collision domain, you keep the number of computers within that collision domain small enough that you don't run into any problems. And then if you need to communicate with a computer in a different collision domain, essentially a different computer network, uh, we come up with a, a system for doing that. Uh, there's something called a bridge, uh, or nowadays we'd be using a router to do this type of thing. And so this is one of the basic concepts to be thinking about with the whole Ethernet standard, basically the idea of collision avoidance, uh, collision detection, and then these collision domains. Uh, we do now have equipment that obviously allows you to have thousands of computers uh, on any one particular network. We use something called a switch in order to do that, but a switch is kind of like a hub on steroids, and we'll get to that in one of the next parts uh, for this particular class. So now that you understand the basic concepts of a collision domain, we're going to have to go a couple of steps to the left or a couple of steps to the right to explain a couple of other things before we can get to hubs and switches and routers to, to basically be able to explain to you how we've been able to deal with uh, collision domains uh, in, in current infrastructure. Again, one of the important things to understand when you're going to be learning technology is many times you got to learn multiple concepts all at the exact same time and none of the concepts make a lot of sense until you understand all of the concepts and then everything kind of slots into place. It's one of those things you need to know this, 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 and this in order to understand what's going on. But to understand one, you have to understand five. In order to understand three, you have to understand one and five. And understand four, you probably need to understand two, right? So that's one of the things. So when you're trying to learn networking, uh, what's really important to be thinking about when you're going to be studying for this is basically read through things or learn things again as you're watching this video and then just realize you may have to go back and re-watch the video or re-read whatever whatever book it is you're reading um, after you've done it the first time for that all for all of the concepts to be able to make sense right that's kind of one of those things in the networking world in order to understand it you got to understand it all and it gets to be a bit of a mess. So anyways, the first thing uh, that we're going to get into when we start talking about Ethernet equipment is the cabling itself. Uh, so basically, you should have probably heard about twisted pair cable at this point in time. Uh, and on the screen, you can see this is what twisted pair cable looks like. So basically, you have four pairs. So you have your... Uh, your um, does this work? There we go. Uh, you have your green, a uh, white green pair. You have your brown, white brown pair. You have your orange, white orange pair, and you have your blue, white blue pair. Right. So these, uh, all of these uh, uh, twisted pair cables, basically get connected into. Uh, your little connector thing, your, what's called a keystone connector. Um, and this is the cable that you're going to be using uh, for connecting up an Ethernet network. Now, when you do start looking at this cable, uh, there there is a lot more to it uh, than you may realize. Uh, one of the things with this is you'll notice though that it's those twisted pairs, like these pairs are actually twisted together. And one of the reasons that that's done is that's done to eliminate or at least ele lessen electromagnetic interference. So it's kind of weird talking about these subjects, you know, in the 2020s because there were a lot of problems. Again, you're dealing with Ethernet. It came from 1973, right? Issues that they had back in 1973 or 1980s aren't quite as significant as they are today. So one of the big problems that, that they used to have with using networking cables is essentially uh, electromagnetic interference from other electrical devices that might be around uh, these networking cables. Uh, so uh, if you're going to be running networking cable, right, it's really easy to run cables where other types of cables have been run before. So a lot of times a uh, networking cable will be run beside coax cable, it might be run beside power cable. It might go very near light sources, especially fluorescent light sources. And networking equipment, Ethernet networking equipment, used to be so bad uh, that if you ran your network cable by a fluorescent light, that could literally cause major problems on your network. Essentially, uh, fluorescent lights, you know, when, when you look at them, what you don't realize is they're actually flashing very, very quickly. Um, and so that creates an electromagnetic signal. And if you have a networking cable that runs too close to that, uh, there was the possibility that that cable would literally pick up that electromagnetic signal. And then all of a sudden, your computers were trying to figure out what they were being told. 
and it gets to be a bit of a disaster. So what they came up with is it was this concept of these twisted pairs, uh, and these twists uh, don't. Don't ask me exactly, but scientifically, engineeringly, somehow these twists uh, basically protect uh, the the the, uh, the the wiring uh, from picking up so much of these these extra electromagnetic signals that are out there. Um, most of the time, especially nowadays, you'll simply see uh, see UT, UTP, uh, unshielded twisted pair cable. Uh, but sometimes, especially if you go into uh, older networks or maybe if you're, you're, you're using higher quality networking cable, uh, there is also what's called a shielded twisted pair cable. So if you're going to be running your networking cable in an environment with a lot of electromagnetic influence or your boss just has a really big budget and you want to spend it, you can get shielded a uh, uh, twisted pair cable. Basically what this does is it puts an aluminum shield around the twisted pair inside the sheath that, that they're in. Uh, and that simply uh, is, is a way to prevent electromagnetic interference getting into your networking cable. Again, in the 2020s, I can't believe that's going to be a problem. I have run some cable in some gnarly places. Um, haven't had an issue in 20 years, uh, but you know, it's a possibility if you had your cable possibly running by refrigeration units. So refrigeration units with the condensers and all that. I have heard that those can actually put out enough crap uh, that it might cause your network some problems, but generally... Um, you, you should be you should be fine with that equipment. Uh, now beyond that, um, we start talking about the networking cable. You will see uh, different types of networking cable that are being sold. Generally, you're just gonna go out there and just buy the the unshielded twisted pair cable, or possibly the shielded twisted pair cable, and that'll be the end of it. There are other types of networking cable out there that you should think about because for your situation, these types of networking cable uh, might be good for you. And essentially, and when we talk about these types of cable, we're essentially talking about the sheath, what these twisted pair cables are wrapped up in. So one of the types of, uh, of the, the cable that, that you might see if you're going to be taking like your Net Plus test is something called plenum cable, P-L-E-N-U-M cable. And essentially what plenum cable is, is the sheath that goes around the twisted pairs uh, that are inside that networking cable is made of a material that will not become highly toxic toxic in a fire. Plenum cable is like 10 times as expensive as standard cable, but essentially what plenum cable is for is if you are going to be running a network cable literally through your HVAC ducts, right? So your ducts for your, uh, your air conditioner or your heating unit. Um, you know, one of the things to be thinking about if you're trying to get from point A to point B in a building and you have a whole bunch of, of duct work, it might be really easy just to run your cable through that duct work. The issue is, the issue is, especially when you're running like a big, big number of cables through your ductwork, is that the standard, you know, what is sheath of networking cable, uh, if that catches on fire, it can be incredibly toxic. And so most fire regulations, at least in the United States, essentially state you cannot run the standard networking cable through your, uh, through your, your ductwork because they don't want people to die horrible deaths. Uh, so you would you would use plenum cable in order to do that. If you're even thinking about running cable through your ductwork, you probably want to call an electrician or something like that. <clears throat> running cable through ductwork is one of those things, it sounds a lot better when you're initially thinking about it than when you actually go to do it. But anyways, it's one of those things that can be done and in plenum. If you take a test, you'll probably see plenum. Uh, there are other types of uh, networking cable out there, they get with a sheath uh, that you'll actually probably need uh, in the real world. Uh, one of the types that I've used is you can actually simply run a networking cable underground, right? Uh, so when I had buildings in the past before wireless bridges got to be as good as they are nowadays, um, I used to have to connect, you know, different buildings and something like a campus facility. And one one of the things that you can do is there's actually networking cable where the sheath uh, is constructed in such a way that you can uh, you can put that cable underground bare. So you do not need a conduit around it. You do not need anything else. You basically just dig a little trench, run the cable from point A to point B. Uh, you cover everything up and, and it will be okay. The important thing with if you're going to be running cable underground though 
is that you need to make sure that water is not going to seep into uh, your wiring. So normally with these networking cables, right, if they're in a normal environment or if they get a little wet, right, you're not going to have a big issue. It's fine. Here's the thing. <laughs> You put the cable in the ground, you know, a foot in the ground, uh, and then you have a month of rainstorms, and then it's kind of cold, and the ground stays wet. You keep your cable in that environment for a long time, and at some point, moisture will just start to seep into that cable, and something's going to corrode. So you get underground rated cable. It'll cost you a good bit more, uh, but basically the idea there is it's not going to get moisture in it, anything like that. You can just put it into the ground without conduit, uh, and you'll be a-okay. Uh, you can also get armored cable. So armored cable is where there's a metal sheath or possibly a, a much thicker like plastic type sheath uh, around your network cable uh, and this is something that you might use in a light industrial facility uh, again again one of the one of the, the the fun parts of being a technology professional is that sometimes you put hundreds of thousands of dollars of computer and networking equipment into the same facility that warehouse workers are using Right? You have lots and lots of fancy equipment and networking in the same place where people are running around with forklifts and all that kind of stuff. So with, uh, with armored uh, cable, essentially it actually has like a metal or some kind of harder you know, armor around the cable. The idea being if you put this in a light industrial facility, if it gets rubbed up by a pallet, you know, somebody lays a shovel across it or something else, hopefully you're, they're not going to cut into it. And you're not going to have to go out there and do troubleshooting. But basically with all this, again, we're talking about the sheath that is actually around the cable itself. Now we start looking at using uh, the, the network cable. Um, one of the things to, to be thinking about is that you actually only get uh, 100 meters of length with network cable. So uh, let me scroll down here a bit, right? So basically when you're connecting point A to point B, that run can only be 100 meters in length or 328 feet. You know, if you're from the US, and you like to you like to make your numbers more complicated. I don't understand what it is with the Ethernet standard or why they've kept it. We're gonna talk about Cat3, Cat5, Cat5e, Cat6 in a second. Uh, but even with Cat6, even with the best Ethernet cable that we currently have, you're still not supposed to have it be uh, farther than a hundred meters from point to point. So basically from, from the computer to what we call the switch, uh, that shouldn't be any more than a hundred meters from one piece of networking equipment to another piece of networking equipment, that shouldn't be any more than a hundred meters. So that's just one of those things to, to keep in your mind. Normally this doesn't come up. Uh, the only time I have had this come up in the real world uh, is again when I was dealing with warehouse facilities and so warehouse facilities you'll have an office on one side you'll have some kind of processing center on the other side and so sometimes the, those those cable runs would be ridiculously long and so you have to figure out how to connect them in the middle uh, but generally this shouldn't be a problem but it is just something to consider especially also if you're thinking about like connecting buildings if you're sitting there going oh i'm just going to run a cable underground from building a to building b just make sure they are closer the whole run the whole run is less than 100 meters because even if you're using the the newest greatest most wonderful uh, cat six uh, cable that's out there um, you're still not supposed to do over 100 meters for those individual runs now when i'm sitting there and i'm talking about these 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 uh, cables Cables, and I say cat 3, cat 5, cat 5e, and cat 6. Basically, these are standards for uh, that twisted uh, pair cable that I was showing you before that you can barely now see, right? So when we take a look at like this, this cable or this network cable here, um, this can be one of these different categories. So the first category of the Ethernet uh, networking cables that came out were category 3. And so basically, the standards for category 3 allowed for 10 megabit per second connection. So you could have computers connected with CAT3 uh, and they're connected for at 10 megabits per second. As time went by, they realized, oh, we need faster connections. Uh, so then they created a standard for what's called CAT5 cable. So back 20 years ago, we were using CAT5 cable and that allowed for uh, up to 100 megabits per second. Then as time went by, 2005 or so, people started using what's called Cat5e cable. Uh, they were rated for up to a gigabit per second. And now everybody should hopefully at this point be installing Cat6 cable. Uh, and those are certified for up to, up to 10 gigabits per second, which 
most of the time should be far more than you ever need. So what's important to understand, we talk about the, the, these, these cables, Cat3, Cat5, Cat5e, and Cat6, is basically they are created to a standard where they are rated for a max speed. Now one of the problems you might run into in the real world is that uh, these cables, when you just look at them, you just pick it up and look at them, they all kind of look the same. Uh, and most cabling is actually in the walls of buildings, right? So uh, I used to make a lot of money, like running cable from point A to point B. One of the problems that you can have in the real business world is if your building uh, had its networking cable run many years ago, possibly 20 years ago, when you start putting your new computers and your new infrastructure in that older building, the wiring that you currently have may not be able to run at the speed that you want, right? So if you have, you know, gigabit, you have uh, network cards, you have uh, servers and networking equipment that can run at a gigabit per second, but all of your network cabling uh, in your building is only Cat5, so it's rated for 100 megabits per second, one of the issues that you can run into is your computer and your equipment are, are much slower than they should be, you're sitting there trying to, trying to um, uh, troubleshoot protocols and collision domains and all that horse crap. And basically what you have is you simply have the cabling not being rated for the speed uh, that you're trying to communicate with with all of your different equipment. And so this is a problem that you can run into in the real world. Because again, from a, from a business owner's perspective, you no know, cabling is just kind of one of those things that's done. It's kind of like plumbing, right? You no know, business owner wants to just redo their plumbing because they're told they should, right? If something breaks, if there's a hard fail, business owners will generally fix it. But when you get these quirky problems, you get into stupid arguments. Stupid arguments are the worst in the business world, but you're going to be dealing with them a lot. And one of the issues you can have is you can have a building that is fully network cable, right? $100,000 was put into networking cabling because... It's a very valuable thing to do. Uh, and it can be a very painful experience to have to go to the CEO and say, hey, guess what? All the network cabling that's in this building, yeah, it's Cat5. We need Cat6. So all of that cabling needs to be ripped out or at least put away. And we need to re-cable this whole building at a cost of fifty dollars to $100,000, right? That's one of the uh, one of the issues uh, that you can run into in the cabling world, especially with, with dealing with businesses and all that. Uh, if we go back and we start looking at the cabling, though, there is some, there are some different components, the basic components we're dealing with cabling uh, that you should just uh, be thinking about. So we have the cable itself, right? So so this mess, right? This mess that we have have right there that I scribbled over. So you have the cable itself. Uh, basically, uh, with that cable, you can make long runs. So again, up to 100 meter runs, and you can connect different points. When you connect those different points, uh, you can either just put a what's called a keystone jack uh, on the end of the cable. So if you create a patch cable, you are going to be essentially connecting uh, this, this, uh, this keystone uh, jack right here. All right, so oops, uh, you connect that to the cable and then you're able to plug that into a computer and plug the other side into a switch or a networking device, that type of thing. Uh, you can also connect that networking cable uh, into a keystone port. So you probably see this in your office environment or your school environment. You go and you look at the wall uh, and you have little keystone ports like this on the wall. Basically, at the uh, on the back of these ports, uh, what you have is you actually have that networking cable that I showed you before, and that networking cable runs all the way to something called a patch panel. Right, so what the patch panel is, is this is where all the cables in the building uh, basically come together. And then what you're able to do is you're able to run a cable from one of these ports uh, over to your switch. And of course, that's not working right. All right, so basically uh, here uh, you have a uh, you have the wire coming in from the back. So this comes from your keystone jack out in your office, right? So you have lots and lots of wires coming in uh, from all of those keystone jacks. And then essentially you have your switch or your, your piece of networking equipment in front of this. And then from all of those keystone jacks, you can then connect patch cables to your network switch. This is very important in a business environment because many times, 
You want flexibility uh, for how you're going to do your networking in your environment, but you're not really sure what that flexibility will look like at the end of the day. So one of the things uh, when you're cabling up an office is you'll put many more drops, you'll put many more of these, these plugs in offices than you will actually have ports in your networking equipment back in your server room. The reason being is a, a switch, again, we'll talk about this in a few minutes, a switch can be very expensive, anywhere between $1,000 to possibly ten thousand uh, dollars with that you'll have a certain number of ports in that switch and so you don't necessarily want every single port on the wall every plug on the wall to be active you want to be able to make them active if you need to but you don't necessarily want to buy all of the, the switch ports to begin with and so what you do is you run all of the cables to a patch panel which is relatively inexpensive and then on the other side you have your networking equipment and then all you have to do is anywhere that there's actually a computer device connected on the network in the building from that port you can connect that to that the, to the to the switch and it's now connected to the network and so this is something to think about right if you have users uh, who plug in uh, to, to the wall, right, to the plug, and it doesn't work, uh, most likely the reason is that the, uh, the port isn't actually active, right? You don't have a patch cable connecting that port to the switch. Again, as I've talked about before when I was talking about the OSI model, right, 99.99999% of your problems uh, as a networking engineer are going to be layer one problems. Layer one problems are the cabling and most of the time the problem is going to be somewhere something was not plugged into the thing that was supposed to be plugged into and so that you've got to go out and, and run and actually fix that right so that's one of the things to be thinking about uh, with the patch cables there and so when we take a look at this let me just pull this up so i can do a little diagram essentially what we're going to have right so we're going to have our computers uh, they're going to have a network card we'll talk about that in a minute basically the cable will run from your from their computer uh, to the to the uh, to the ports that are on the wall those ports on the wall then have cabling that will go all the way back uh, to the server room in the server room there will be this big old what's called a patch panel they come into the back of it you then you have your networking equipment in your server room and then for each port that you want connected, you will then have a patch cable that will then run to that piece of networking equipment. So now these computers can actually communicate with each other on the network. So that kind of gives you a basic idea of how Ethernet cabling works. So now that you understand the basics of Ethernet cabling, now let's talk about the next piece of equipment in the Ethernet world, and those are your NICs, right? So you'll hear of NIC, N-I-C, this is a network interface card. Uh, so we're talking about the NICs, essentially we're talking about every network port on your computer. So if you have a standard computer, you have a standard laptop, you have a standard uh, desktop computer, you'll most likely have one NIC, one port on that computer. Uh, if you have a, you know, a more complicated computer, maybe you're doing some fancier things with, uh, uh, with your computer, you, I don't know, doing some kind of video editing, that type of thing, you may have multiple NICs, multiple network cards, network ports on your computer. If you're dealing with a server, you may actually have a tremendous number of different network ports on that particular server. Uh, basically, each network port may be dealing with different services on the network. It may have different IP addresses assigned to each one of those different uh, NICs, those, those network interface cards. There's a whole bunch of different complicated things to be done. But basically, whenever we're talking about a NIC, we're talking about the NIC. We're actually talking about that single port uh, on your computer. Uh, and so that's an important thing to be thinking about. So we're gonna be talking about MAC addresses in a second, media access control addresses in a second. And it's important to understand there is a MAC address for every NIC. Every port, networking port on your computer has its own media access control address. MAC address is not one single address for the entire computer. So when we start taking a look at these NICs, network interface cards, uh, one of the big things that you'll see is that they have different speeds, right? So now everything should be gigabit, 
Everything should be gigabit per second at least. But again, if you're in the legacy world, if you're in the legacy world, you might be dealing with NICs that are slower than, than what would be standard today. Uh, so uh, again, we start talking about the Ethernet standard. The Ethernet standard originally started at 10 megabits per second, and then went to 100 megabits per second, and then went to a gigabit per second, 1,000 uh, megabits per second. And we now have 10 gigabit per second uh, Ethernet networks. We now have 40 gigabit per second Ethernet networks. And I think, I haven't seen them. They either do exist or they're testing it. We have a uh, hundred uh, gigabit per second Ethernet networks at this point in time. And so one of the things to be thinking about when you're doing troubleshooting or when you're trying to figure out why there may be an issue with, with speed on your network is if you're dealing with an old server or an old computer, it may have an older networking card and that networking card can only go to, to whatever speed it was designed to go to. Uh, so this can be a big issue in the legacy world. So um, when you when you go into your, your computer environment uh, for your enterprise, your organization. Um, you may have very old equipment that's just trucking along doing whatever it's done. Uh, one of the big problems we, we have in the technology world is that uh, managers or CEOs, they don't want to replace things until they break, which unfortunately means you can have some very old equipment. Like it's funny to think about, like you think about computers and you think about computers failing uh, relatively often, you know, every couple of years or five years, maybe a computer lasts 10 years. Well, the thing is sometimes some of these computers last 20 years. And they just keep doing whatever it is, like maybe a payroll functionality, some kind of database functionality, some real basic thing, scheduling or whatever for your company. And somebody installed it back in 2000 and it's kept doing whatever the hell it's supposed to do. And it just keeps doing it, doing it, doing it, doing it, doing it. One of the issues that you can run into is that you think about technology from the modern world. You don't understand why something is so slow, that type of thing. And one of the issues may be you're just dealing with very old equipment. So this is something just to keep in mind uh, when you're thinking about networking speeds is as I talked about before, you have these different categories of cable, Cat3, Cat5, Cat5e, and Cat6, right? They go anywhere from 10 megabits per second all the way to 10 gigabits per second. But then you have the network cards themselves. You can also run into this problem with the networking equipment we'll talk about in the future is that with something like a switch, switches may be there for a long time, right? You may have a 15 year old switch in your environment, you connect a whole bunch of computers with, with gig networking and they're all funneling through a, a 10, 100 switch and they're only going to be doing 100 megabits per second at absolute max. So past that, one of the things you have to be thinking about with the ethernet world and the fact that this is not magic. Again, remember in technology, it's not magic. This all, this all has to work for a reason, is one of the big things in the Ethernet world is that the network has to be able to uniquely identify all the different network ports uh, in that environment. So every single NIC, every single port on your computer has to have a globally unique identifier. And this, of course, is one of those times I giggle every once in a while with people, people worried about things that already exists. Eli, Eli, did you know, did you know they're trying to hard code a globally unique identifier into everybody's computer? Right, I'm sure you've heard that before. They, they've, they've tried this before, putting it into like CPUs or whatever else. And what's funny, it's funny, what makes me giggle is, yeah, yeah, we, we've, we've had globally unique identifiers basically since the Ethernet standard got created, right? So one of the things uh, with, uh, with uh, the computer networking devices when you're dealing with an Ethernet network is that all the devices have to have some kind of identifier so the network knows basically who's supposed to be communicated with uh, when, whenever communication is happening, basically how to send, send communications, receive communications, the whole nine yards. So you normally have probably heard of IP addresses, so 192.168.1.1, right? That's up up in the networking level, the OSI model, that is something that you generally uh, are able to configure manually. Down at the Ethernet level, though, we're dealing with layer two, right? Remember the data link layer? Down at the data link layer, uh, we need a way to be able to identify all of these different, uh, basically, uh, ports and networking ports in our environment. And so we have something called the MAC address. The MAC address, by and large, is hard-coded. I crap you not. I crap you not. This already exists. It's already existed for 50 years. Years. <laughs> Basically, you have a globally unique 
hard-coded identifier in literally every single networking port on your computer or networking device. Uh, if you go and you, you're able to pull up um, the, the MAC address uh, for your particular computer, right? So, uh, so this is just an example off of a MAC computer. Um, the, uh, the MAC address, uh, as we see down here, this Wi-Fi address, uh, basically this is a hexadecimal address. Uh, you get two digits uh, with a colon in between. What happens here is basically this address is separated into two parts. The first part of this address is the organizational identifier, right? So Netgear, Cisco, Microtech, I don't know, whoever the hell manufactured uh, this particular uh, networking port, uh, they put their identifier on the front part. And this is why if you do networking scanning, uh, this is why your network scanning software is able to determine the manufacturer or vendor uh, of the equipment that it sees on your network, right? Because this, this is a known, this is basically just a known uh, organizational unit identifier. And so if it sees this person, this part of the beginning of a MAC address, and it knows that that is used by Netgear, then it knows that's a piece of Netgear equipment. So that's one of the, the ways this is used practically. Uh, then then uh, the last half of this, uh, on the other side, basically that's the unique identifier for that vendor, right? So it's basically like a serial number. Every every new you know network interface that, that gets produced, that, that it just you know gets tallied up with a different serial number. And so with that, you have a organizational unit identifier with what should essentially be a unique serial number on the other end. And therefore, we get a globally unique identifier that's hard coded. Uh, and everybody, basically every computer that's been built for the past couple of decades, right? And so this MAC address is what uh, allows uh, computers and devices to be identified uh, at that data link layer uh, in Ethernet networking. Now, when I've talked about the MAC address, you're probably like, well, wait a minute, but, 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 Eli, I thought you could modify the MAC address. And you can in some instances. Um, especially sometimes with routers or other types of networking equipment, uh, you can clone a MAC address or change the MAC address. Um, sometimes with your standard computer, you may be able to download a piece of software that allows you to change a MAC address. And that can be used sometimes um, in a non-nefarious way, in a good way, if you have MAC address filtering on your network. Uh, this used to be very prominent with cable internet service providers. It's been a long time since I've dealt with one, so I'm not sure if they're still using this as a security feature nowadays. But back in the old days, um, essentially you could either rent a cable modem from your, your cable ISP, or you could buy a cable modem that was a hell of a lot cheaper. The issue was, is that how the cable internet service providers maintain security on their, their internet connection was by doing MAC address filtering. So they would only allow certain MAC addresses to actually be able to communicate on their network. And so what you could do is when you bought that new cable modem, you could go into a configuration panel and essentially in that configuration panel, you could give that cable modem the same MAC address as whatever the cable ISP was going to give you. And so there are some, some ways and some reasons you can actually change uh, this MAC address uh, for nefarious reasons. There's just a whole ton of reasons you would do it for nefarious reasons, uh, but from uh, non-nefarious, for, for good reasons, there, there's also reasons that you would do that. And that's because within your, your network, you may have something like MAC address filtering that literally says only these certain MAC addresses are allowed to communicate on the network. So if you don't see this MAC address, don't allow it to happen. Happen. So one of the things you can do is simply modify that MAC address. But basically, you know, these are some of the things to be thinking about when you're dealing with these network interface cards. You've got the different speeds. You know, make sure you know what speed they're, they're running at. And then you've got the MAC address for every single port uh, on your card. Okay, so now we can get back to what we were talking about before with collision domains, right? So one of the big failures of the Ethernet technology standard is these darn 
collision domains. Again, when any computer wants to communicate on the network, it is going to listen to see if anybody else is trying to communicate. If nobody else is trying to communicate, it will send its communication out. If two computers try to communicate at the exact same time, there will be a collision that will be detected by all the computers on the network. The computers that were trying to communicate will wait a random amount of time before they try to communicate again, and then they will try to communicate again. In a relatively small network, this will work fine, adequate enough. The problem is you start to get more and more and more and more computers on your network. More computers are all trying to communicate at the same time. You get more collisions. You have more computers randomly waiting an amount of time. The more computers you have on the network, the more likely it is that random amount of time will be the same for more of those computers. They will, and it just turns into a crap show, right? Basically you have uh, what is called a broadcast storm and your network comes to a halt. And so this is the world that we were at when we started off whoops when we started off with bridges back in the day right so uh so when we started with the initial ethernet standard back in, let's say 1973 or the 1980s you would have something called a hub all of your computers all of your servers all of your your gadgets or gadgets or whatever were connected to what was called a hub and essentially all this hub all this hub was was a splitter Think about it like the coax splitters when you split up a cable connection for your house, and that is quite literally what it was. Uh, they started off with hubs, then they got fancier, and they come up with powered hubs, because one of the problems you had is you had all these computer devices connected to a hub that wasn't powered. You could get some issues because there wasn't actually enough electricity to, to run the signals as far as they needed to go. So, you know, after a while, they, they created a powered hubs to actually make that kind of communication a little bit better. But the issue that you kept running into is that you could only make an ethernet network so big before basically it, it ground to a freaking halt uh, because of all of the collisions that were going on. You get those broadcast storms. And so then somebody came up with an idea and they said, hmm, what if, what if we could create a networking device, a piece of networking equipment that would know what MAC addresses were on like either side of it, and then if a MAC address was on the other side, it would allow the network communication to go through, but if it wasn't on the other side, it would just stop, right? So what if, what if we could have these hubs? So we're still back in a hub world. We're still back in a hub world, right? And so they came up with this idea of connecting the collision domains with what was called a bridge, right? So it's just a standard, it's called a bridge. And back in the day, it essentially had uh, two network ports on it. And when communication was going on, the bridge would be listening. And basically, it would be listening to know what MAC addresses were on what side of the bridge, right? So if you had one computer over here, and it's trying to communicate with another computer within the same collision domain, right? That communication is going to go to the hub, and it's going to go out to every single port on the hub, including to the bridge. Now the bridge knows that the computer that this computer is trying to communicate with is on this side of the bridge, so then it will stop the communication. It will not allow the networking communication to go through. If on the other hand, right, this computer is trying to communicate with this computer over here, communication goes into the hub, it goes out every single port of the hub, again, including to the bridge, the bridge goes, oh, the MAC address this computer is looking for is over here, so I will then basically forward that traffic over to this other collision domain uh, to allow the communication to go through. And so with this, they were able to create more and more of these collision domains, essentially connected with bridges, and then yay, we had 1980s networking technology. It was better than 1970s networking technology, but if you take a look at this, this is still pretty crappy and horrible. And so, as as things go by, as technology goes better, you know, somebody's sitting there and they're looking at that bridge, right? That, that bridge, you know, connects all these different, you know, or these different uh, collision domains. And somebody has this bright, bright idea and it says, well, if this bridge has two ports currently, why couldn't we put more ports on the bridge? Essentially, why couldn't we have a single bridge connected to multiple collision domains? Right? That would be better instead of just having it connected to one. And then somebody said, well, hell, what if, what if we had something like a bridge with all of these ports 
that would only forward communica communication to the appropriate MAC address, but that was actually connected to each individual computer or networking device. So now, instead of communication going in from one computer and going out through every single port on the hub, what if we had this type of networking equipment that had a MAC address table that MAC address table said what MAC address was connected to what port on this piece of networking device so that if a computer tries to communicate with another computer on this, this, uh, this piece of networking equipment, that communication will simply get routed to that one port uh, that the other com computer or networking device is communicated with, right? And that is where we get the idea of a switch and that is why we can now have 1,000, 2,000, theoretically 10,000 computers all on the same network, theoretically, sort of, within the same collision domain. Because each one of these ports is then working as it's essentially its own bridge. It will only allow traffic to go through if it knows the MAC address uh, is on the other side of that. And so that's the world that we get to today. Uh, one of the things that I'll say is sometimes if you're going to a very crappy technology education school, this, this is a way, this is a way you can know how good the school you're going to is, is if they give you a network diagram and they ask you where the hubs should go. Oh, I about lost my temper a number of years ago. So what, 10 years ago? I don't know. Whenever I had my consulting company, I had one of my employees. One of my employees was going through a very expensive technology school in order to learn how to do networking. And I still remember he came to me one day and said, Eli, Eli, I'm, I'm, I'm confused here. I'm confused, right? Uh, so I'm supposed to diagram out this network and I've got the router and I have the wireless access point. I got the switch. I got all this stuff. But they've given me three hubs to use in this network. Eli, where should I use these three hubs? And I looked at him. I looked at the diagram. I said, um, yeah, I don't see the trash can on the diagram. <laughs> where, where is the trash can on this diagram? Uh, to be clear, to be clear, in the IT world, I have never used a hub. I have never used a hub for the standard reason that you're supposed to use a hub. This crap was trash when I was getting into the IT world. So if your school asks you where to put the hub on the network and they don't have a trash can in that schematic, Quit that school today. Now, one of the, the one of the things to be thinking about, though, is you will hear that hubs actually have a use in the real world. Like some some tech pros or tech noobs will be like, "No, Eli, keep that hub. You can use it." One of the reasons that you can use a hub uh, is basically if you want to do uh, packet snuffing or essentially if you want, want to monitor the network or if you want to monitor communication going to a specific device on the network. Because basically what you can do is you can split the communication going into and out of the computer that you want to monitor, connect your computer to the hub so that it's listening to everything going on. Uh, this can be used for, for good, for maintenance purposes, to understand what's going on better with your network, or this can be used for nefarious purposes, basically to, to, to snarfle up uh, all of the communication going to a server, right? So if you have a switch, oops, uh, so basically, again, you have your switch here, you have all of your different computers that's connected to the switch. One of the reasons you could legitimately use a hub is let's say over here you have your server. So I don't know, you have a, you have a web server, www, it's a web server. And let's say you're getting, again, quirky problems. You're not getting hard fails. God bless hard fails. It's wonderful. When things just fail, it's a beautiful day. Things many times just don't normally fail. Yeah, you'll get weird. All right, sessions will fail. Some people get on. Some things are slow. Who the hell knows why? You don't know if it's a denial of service attack. You don't know if there's some crappy ass network setting that's not set up properly in your network. You don't understand what's going on. So one of the things that you could do, right? So this is a switch, to be clear. This is a switch right here. So one of the things you could do is you could set up a server. You could set up a computer to log all of the network traffic that is going to and from your web server. In order to be able to actually collect that information, what you could do is you could have the network cable go to an old-fashioned hub. Again, this is a hub, not a switch. 
One port will then go to your server. One port will then go to your, your collection server. And that way, everything that come, goes from your web server will go to the hub. It will then get it will continue on to the switch and it will go to that server. All the communication that is going to your web server, again, will get split. It will go to this collection server and then it will go to web server. And so that's one of the reasons uh, that you can use a hub uh, in the real world, uh, basically, in order to collect this information. Again, for legitimate purposes, a lot of times, again, we don't have hard fail, especially in an enterprise environment. Figuring out exactly what the hell is going on can be a pain. And so if you can collect all of that network traffic, put it back together, then you might be able to understand, oh, Oh, this is this is the the issue there's some kind of you know request and response thing isn't working properly one of the things that i'll warn you though one of the things i'll warn you is remember for the most part hubs are old hubs are old 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 right so if you have a 10 megabit per second hub and you connect it to your one gigabit per second server and your one gigabit per second switch how fast do you think the network traffic will be from and to your web server. Remember, it's as fast as the slowest component. So if you put a 10 megabit per second hub oh, between your web server and the rest of the network, I know the problem. I see the problem right there. So this is something you have to keep in mind. Uh, you know, they had 10 100 uh, hubs back in the day, so you might be able to get a 10 100, a 10 100 uh, uh, hub for being able to do this type of thing. The other thing to think about, again, when you're analyzing server communication, you might not need a gigabit per second. Just, just because your computer can do a gigabit per second, especially as a server, it might not actually be using a gigabit per second. So, I don't know, a file server or something else, uh, the actual speed that it's using might only be, you know, 50 megabits per second, something like that. And so, again, using one of those hubs might make sense. Um, so, this is something that can be used. I'd be highly, I'd be highly careful. Be highly careful about using it. One of the things built into modern switches, so if you go out and buy a Cisco switch, most likely even if you buy a Ubiquiti switch, is you can actually uh, clone ports within the switch itself. So instead of dealing with that whole hub thing, essentially what you can do is within the configuration panel of the switch, you can say that you want one port to mirror another port. That basically gives you the hub functionality within the switch. Again, you put your monitoring server, you connect your, your web server or whatever else, and that way you can keep the networking speed at something reasonable, and you do not add idiotic networking problems to your infrastructure, right? So this is uh, what a bridge is, and this is what a switch is. Again, and this is where we go to you know, that media access control address. Basically, how the switch is able to operate and how the bridge was able to operate is by using that globally unique MAC address to essentially know where all the different computer devices are on the network to know where they should route the traffic. Now, with the Ethernet standard, one of the things with Ethernet standard uh, is that you can have what is called routable protocols. Uh, so we talk about routable protocols. This is where we're talking about TCP IP version four in general. Uh, there's also TCP IP version six. This is something that you will be using in the modern world. Again, you go back 20 years ago, hopefully you still don't have this garbage on your test. There was something called IPX SPX that was also a routable protocol. It uses, it uses its own configurations and that type of thing. And basically what a routable protocol allows you to do is it allows you to logically separate networks, right? So when we talked about that bridge or we talked about that switch, um, there's not a lot of manual configuration there. Right, it reads the MAC address. If the MAC address is on the other side of the port, it sends the uh, the communication. If not, it doesn't. That doesn't give you you a lot of configura configurability. So what what a routable protocol allows you to do is it allows you to create rules uh, for whether or not traffic should be routed to different networks. And so that's with. Uh, with a router, uh, what happens is you have you know your your network and it's all connected to a switch. One of the ports on the switch will be connected to the router, and then that router will have rules on how network traffic should be uh, should be sent or received uh, from other uh, networks that that router is uh, can, uh, 
connected to. Uh, so you may have this in like a campus environment. So one building may be its own, we'll talk about this in a second, LAN, local area network. They're all connected to one switch. And then you have a different building. That different building has a switch um, and that those two buildings will be connected to that router. And depending upon the rules in the router, uh, traffic will either be forwarded or it will not be forwarded. And so this is where this will be a different class. This is where we start talking about IP addresses, 192.168.1.1. This is where we talk about subnet masks, 255.255.255.0. This is where we talk about default gateways. Again, 192.168, whatever the, the router address is, is the whole nine yards. And so what routers do, routers allow allow you to separate uh, networks based off of logical rules, essentially with this whole IP address subnet masking scheme that allows you to configure things to say how you want that traffic to move. So when you're thinking about the networking equipment that you're going to be seeing in the real world, one, you're not going to see hubs. Not going to see hubs. <sighs> Gotta stop. All that is is a splitter. You shouldn't see it in the real world. Again, bridges, what bridges allowed you to do was connect those separate collision domains. Uh, again, not really any manual configuration there. It's kind of an automatic thing. Then you have switches. Essentially, what switches do is they make every single port uh, in that hub type device, basically every single port in that, that network connect connectivity device, its own bridge. It will only forward communication to the appropriate computer. Again, all of that is based off of MAC addresses that, that more or less are hard coded. Then you get up to routers routers then start allowing you to separate uh, your networks based off of logical rules and allow you to say basically where network traffic should or should not go. So now that you understand the basic network equipment, the, the switches, the routers, that type of thing, now we can talk about the good old LANs, WANs, and possibly MANs or CANs, that type of thing. Basically, when we talk about uh, these acronyms, we're thinking about logical ways to separate networks and determine what computers and devices should be communicating with other uh, computers and devices. So when we talk about LAN, a LAN is a local area network. So essentially, that is all of the computers that are connected to your switch or to your series of switches in the networking closet, right? So on a LAN, more or less, all of the computers or devices on that LAN can see all of the other computers and devices that are on the LAN and based off of configuration, they more or less should be able to communicate with each other. Again, we talked about routers though, right? So with LANs, everything is kind of automatically sent to all the other computers, more or less essentially based off of MAC addresses. Uh, there's not a lot of manual configuration there. Then we get to WANs, and that's where I started talking about the routers before, right? So if I have a LAN here, and let's say I want to connect you know, this LAN to a different LAN. Uh, so we may want to connect the LAN to, um, again, different buildings, different buildings in an environment. You may want to connect um, possibly offices, theoretically on the other side of the country, right? So, uh, so I don't know if we've got our country here. <laughs> great, great, great artist. But you know, we got our San Francisco office here and we got our Washington DC office here. This is a LAN. This is a LAN. If we want to be able to connect these two together, we can have a router. And then basically what happens there is the WAN is everything on the other side of the router from your LAN, right? So I've got my LAN in Washington, D.C. My LAN connects into the router and the WAN is everything else that that router can communicate with. So uh, the LAN in San Francisco would be part of the WAN. Maybe you have something down in Austin, Texas, that would be part of the WAN. Maybe you have something on Toronto and that would be part of the LAN. And so again, one of the very important things to be thinking about in computers and technology and networking is this idea of logically subdividing things so they understand how to better design the infrastructure and that type of deal. And so the LAN is everything that is local. The WAN is everything uh, that is that is outside basically on the other side of the router uh, in many ways you can think of the internet as the WAN a lot of times when we talk about the WAN hey, yeah I don't I don't know if that's the most accurate term in the world but we still use it it's kind of like Ethernet is it accurate I don't know 
That's what we say. Um, and so uh, when you have your your local area network connect to the, uh, the internet, many times the internet will be considered the WAN. That'll be the WAN side of your network, that the external side of the network, the side that is on the other side of the router. So that's the basic idea with LANs and WANs. LANs, everything's local. And the WAN is essentially everything else that your computers can communicate with that is on the other side of the router. Then we get to MANs and CANs. Because again, we've got to be thinking about things logically. If we don't, if we can't visualize what we're trying to build, it all becomes a disaster, right? And so when we talk about MANs or CANs, this is a uh, metropolitan uh, area network or possibly a campus area network. And the idea here is that essentially you're logically grouping LANs together, right? So you have a bunch of different LANs and you want to logically group them together and kind of make them closer than the rest of the WAN, right? So the rest of the WAN, um, so you might think about this, let's see, University of California system, right? So the University of California has many, 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 many different campuses. So let's imagine um, the WAN is all of these different campuses. You're building or maintaining lands within a single campus. And so what you may want to do is you may want to logically essentially put all of those lands into a campus area network to say, hey, these, these LANs in this network are more likely to communicate with each other and have security policies that, that are appropriate with each other. Right? Somebody here might be able to print on a computer over here, or somebody over here may be able to get a database over on this LAN here. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to create this campus area network. So this LAN, you know, this LAN might be in the administration building. You might have a LAN there. You may have a LAN in, let's say, a research building. You may have a LAN for your uh, your um, uh, your co. Where is it? Everybody goes. Yeah, I don't know your cafeteria where all the all their kids go. So the kids get on the wireless network. So you may want a LAN for the kids when they get on their, their, their the wireless network. You may want a LAN for the lab. But the thing is, so you may want somebody that's on the cafeteria network uh, to be able to communicate with a server in the administration building. Right? So you want to be able to configure it so that communication is, it goes relatively easily. Uh, they can use the same credentials, the same accounts, that type of thing. Uh, somebody in the administration building might want to be able to send a print job over to the lab, that type of thing. And so when we talk about a CAN or a campus area network, there are routers. So there are routers that separate all of these LANs, but you configure those routers in such a way uh, that it makes communication a lot more permissible. Right? You may have a lot of security here. You may have your industrial class uh, firewall between your CAN and the rest of the WAN. You may have a lot of security rules, right? Port, you can block a lot of ports, that type of thing. Where within your campus, uh, again, things may be a lot more permissible. The other thing to be thinking about too, when you think about something like a CAN or a metropolitan area network, is that how you connect your network may be different, right? So. Most of the time nowadays, when we're connecting to the WAN or we're connecting to remote offices, we're going through the cloud. So we talk about the cloud, all the cloud is, is the internet, right? You have your ISP connection, your ISP connection gets you to the cloud, they have an ISP connection on the other side that gets you into their building, right? So you're connected through fiber lines, carry a great ethernet, who the hell knows? You're connected through something. Well, something to be thinking about, right? If you own your own campus, so let's say talk about a warehouse facility, right? You have a you have a whole bunch of uh, warehouse buildings, or again, you have a college campus, that type of deal. One of the things to be thinking there is that you actually own the land, right? So one of the things to be thinking about with the campus area network is you may look at it and say, hey, you know what? I want to connect all these buildings together with fiber. Right? So we've got a decent budget, so I'm going to connect all of these buildings together with fiber. So each building has its own LAN, and then the routers will be connected with fiber, and we'll design out our infrastructure that way. You may have, in, in a particular environment, you may have something where maybe for some reason fiber doesn't work. So you say, okay, well this connection, I want to do something like a wireless bridge. So basically you use a Wi-Fi connection on one side, Wi-Fi uh, receiver on the other, and you're able to bridge the connection that way. And so with a campus area network especially, many times you are actually able to build that connective infrastructure to, to whatever specifications that you're looking for.
And so that's all we're talking about. We're talking about LANs, WANs, and MANs. LAN is a local area network. More or less, it's everything connected to that switch or that series of switches, right? All the computers, all the printers, everything else, that's on a LAN. You can then logically separate out different networks, again, using routers, using an IP address scheme. We'll talk about IP addresses in another class, but basically with those routers, and those routers can then connect different LANs. Basically, the idea here is anything on the exterior side of the router to you is considered the WAN, the wide area network. Again, a lot of people think of the cloud as the WAN, Ethernet, Ethernet, <laughs> again, not sure that that's the best definition, but we'll go for it. Uh, finally, again, when you start talking about those CAN, the campus area networks, metropolitan area networks, that type of deal, the idea here is that you have buildings or such that are relatively close together. They have their own lands. You will connect all of those different buildings using your, your own, most likely uh, the networking infrastructure that you own, fiber lines, your own cabling, that type of thing. So those, those lands will have a much closer connection than the WAN, right? So you'll have, you'll have a building, right? So you have, you know, whoops, you have multiple buildings. And then you have one place that has your connection to the cloud. And so all of these different buildings, they'll be able to communicate with each other. And then when they need to go out to CNN.com or whatever else, they'll be able to use that single connection or possible multiple connections to get out to the cloud. And that's what we're talking about with MANs and CANs. So there you go. There's the basics of Ethernet technology for networking, how we're going to connect all these devices and how, how these computers are going to be connected together. Again, we talked about the, the actual cabling, CAT3, CAT5, CAT5, CAT5E, CAT6. We talked about what hubs are. We talked about what MAC addresses are. We talked about, you know, the difference between the switches and we talked about the difference between the routers. We talked about LANs, WANs, MANs, CANs, all that kind of stuff. And so much of this, again, is all based around the, the initial concept with Ethernet of the concept of collision avoidance, collision detection, right? So basically with the base Ethernet standard, everything is connected together. The computer devices wait to listen to see if any other device is trying to communicate on the network. If they are, they try to communicate. If two devices communicate at the same time or more, a collision happens on the network, they hear the collision, the collision is detected, they wait a ra random amount of time, and then they try to communicate again. Again, this all works fine for five or six or whatever computers. 500 or 600 computers, it all goes to hell really quick. You get something called a broadcast storm where all the computers essentially lose their darn minds. They're all they're all randomly waiting and then trying to communicate and then, then detecting the, the collisions and everything kind of goes to hell. From there, that's where we got to the bridges and then that's where we got to the switches, the whole nine yards. One of the most important things to really get through your head when you look at the whole Ethernet standard is that it's pretty crappy to be honest with you. Again, we are talking, what is this, 50 year? This is 50 year old concepts at this point in time that we have been duct taping for 50 years. When you when you look at when you look at the news, when you read the news and you hear about hacking attacks and you hear about networking problems and you hear about so many issues, I just want you to understand the biggest the biggest problem starts with the fact that we're using 50 year old technology the idea that technology you know you know improves at the speed of light again for for users for consumers it seems that way for anybody that actually uses this technology it's amazing how much of the technology we're using right now looks a hell of a lot like what it did 30 years ago they, they reskinned it they put a pretty gooey on it but it's basically 1990s technology at best. And so that's where you run into a, a lot of issues. But I hope, to, I hope this gives you a basic idea, again, of the Ethernet technology, basically how it works. And so past this, uh, we'll begin to get into more about networking communication, and then we'll get into the TCP IP protocols and the rest of it. And now that you kind of understand this layer of the technology, TCP IP, hopefully, 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 it will be a lot easier for you. Uh, so, as always, uh, I enjoyed teaching this particular class and look forward to seeing you at the next one.